Right, what I'm gonna do is with the live streams, just try and shake it up a bit and evolve things a little bit. What I do is I have a topic of the week, which will be river cruising. So I'll cover a couple of quick uh, top questions that I get asked all the time. So let me start off with four of the most frequent questions I get asked about river cruising, and we will come to some of the great questions that I've seen already being posted. And that at the end of this, I will give you my tip of the week, which includes uh, a giveaway, a chance to enter a giveaway. So that should be a lot of fun as well. So uh, hopefully uh, you'll stick around for that. So um, I get f asked four questions a lot about river cruising, and I can see already in the questions that some of this will apply to some of the questions that people are asking. Um, I get asked a lot around what is the best first time river to do as a European river cruise? Um, and I always answer that it's either the Rhine, if you want to see lots of castles and particularly parts of Germany, um, a big part winds through there. Although my personal favorite that I recommend for first time is, is the Danube. Uh, the advantage of the Danube, you, you get to see quite a wide range of countries in a classic seven night, but you also get to see three capital cities. So you'll get to see Vienna, you'll get to see Budapest, and you'll get to see Bratislava. Oh, which is a bit of a day trip out. But um, that's what I always recommend, those two rivers. Now, there's many, many, many other rivers, of course, but as a first timer, that's what I um, absolutely recommend. Um, I also get asked around which cruise line, and that's a bit like, it depends on really what you're looking for in terms of river cruise. So I have a separate video, which I'll actually link in the um, in, in the, the box below, uh, so you can have a look at that. I get asked a lot around, what is the best Christmas river cruise? And I can see um, Hetty, for example, has just booked an Amma Waterways one for a Christmas markets cruise. <laughs> Hopefully, I wanna suggest one that you, 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 uh, you, you've booked. But um, of course, any Christmas market cruise is great. Obviously, it's chilly and cold, um, but Europe has amazing Christmas markets. Um, uh, so I think I always tend to gravitate I recommend more the Rhine. You know, Germany for me is kind of the home of, uh, and what I always associate with Christmas markets. So even in the in London, for example, all the Christmas markets they sort of theme as German Christmas markets. So I always recommend looking at the Rhine because you have those beautiful castly kind of places. However, I have been to some amazing Christmas markets when I was on a, a, a Danube River cruise. So like in Vienna, has an incredible Christmas market cruise. But those are the two really where they. They're, you know, they really focus. It's going to be one of one of those two. And what the good news is, is a wide range of lines are now doing that. So you can also go with the very luxury lines, or if you're more of a budget traveler, you can get more of a budget option as well. So that's great. The next question I get asked a lot around European river cruising is, what is the best line for entertainment, enrichment, local uh, food and wine, um, and kind of local immersion? Now, in reality, what I always say to people is, whichever river cruise line you go on, you will get uh, a good immersion into local food and wine. The, the ships are just not big enough to able to stock a lot of foods. So they will pick it up pretty much almost every day. So by definition, as they move through the region, uh, and because the numbers aren't great, you know, it's 100, maybe 150 people, they're able to, unlike cruise ships, cater you know, locally. And of course, they have relationships with local people uh, and local providers. So you will find that whichever cruise line you're on will reflect the region that they're traveling through, partly because they have to. So they will also have local wines. So if you're going through Germany, German wines, through Austria, and, and so on. So you will tend to find that. In terms of enrichment, Unlike, say, if you go on a Cunard or other ships, you do not really get a lot of enrichment specifically, but what you will have every night is a briefing from the, the, the cruise director who will brief you a little bit around the region you pass it through, what you're seeing, but it's the guides who do most of that. If you're going on for entertainment, you will be sorely disappointed. The entertainment at most will be a pianist, and they will occasionally bring on maybe some singers or some dancers. So you're not gonna get a lot of entertainment. There's no casino. And the other thing that concerns people a lot is water levels. So in Europe, you have a problem with low water levels and high water levels. Um, and I get asked this a lot, is there any best month? Uh, so the, the way the water levels work in Europe is at the beginning of the season, the rivers rely a lot on how good the, snows have, the snow has been as it melts. And then later in the year, it relies on the rain. So I personally always say to look a little bit earlier on, although actually most of the river cruises I've done have been later in the year, and they have been a little bit more erratic. The other Downside, of course, of that is if it's incredible snow, you can also have floods. So if you go to Passau, uh, which is one of the key stops, uh, you know, if you're going uh, like on the Rhine and so on, you will, they have markers up the church showing the, the flooding levels. But generally speaking, it's very hard to predict. So those are some of the most asked questions that I get of all. So let's dive into any other of your river cruise or other questions that you may have. So Peter um, uh, popped, let me take that. Um, 
let me take that little goodie off and I'll put a Q&A goodie up. So um, Peter asked the question, which is, are all river cruises the same with tours and excursions included or pre-booked or can you go bare and do whatever you like in each port? So Peter, um, it used to be more the case that cruise lines, uh, you know, river cruise lines did include excursions. And so river cruising is pretty costly. You know, I, I, I was looking again, I was thinking, oh, I should do some more river cruising. I haven't done it. Uh, I haven't done any river cruising since the, uh, you know, the pandemic shutdown. And I feel I should be going back, uh, any European river cruising I've done uh, out of river, Europe river cruising. Um, but um, it's, it's really expensive, particularly if you're going solo, because it's, it's harder to get solo deals, although I saw some actually this weekend. Um, but so more a couple more lines are not including excursions, but most of them do. So uh, you know all those all the kind of the premium lines. So your Uniworlds, Scenic, uh, Emma Waterways, as you head into Avalon, Emerald, uh, you know they will all include. But you're finding you know lines like across Europe, for example, depending a little bit where you come from, they they either will build them into the fares for some countries, but generally speaking, either by a package or buy them kind of ad hoc. But there are a couple kind of shifting away from that, but generally speaking, they're included. Um, they tend to be walking tours mostly. Um, so you can go and do your own thing within the time that the ship sails, because you need to bear in mind, sometimes a river cruise boat might be in one stop in the morning to go exploring, will sail while you're having lunch to a different stop. So if you are going self-exploring, you need to really pay attention to the sailing schedule, because unlike a ocean ship, which kind of arrives in the morning and leaves at night, it can be much more erratic, um, but you can go out. I always say the problem with that is, of course, you've already paid for the excursion. So that's always kind of, um, uh, you know, a thing to, to bear in mind. But certainly most of the more premium ones definitely, definitely um, do. But, but there are, it's growing a little bit. Um, excursion wise, as I said, it's mostly walking tours. Uh, you see a lot of cathedrals, to be honest. Um, but some of the lines like um, uh, Avalon, even Amma, they're starting to shift into more hiking, cycling, those kind of those kind of things as well. Bob, another regular here. Um, we don't drink. Would you say a lot of river cruises seem to be aimed at wine slash beer lovers with visits to various uh, wineries and breweries, especially so on the Douro? So, Bob, as you, uh, I think, as you probably know, I don't, I don't drink alcohol either. I haven't seen it as a massive uh, issue, although you are right, particularly when you're passing through very famous, uh, you know, winery areas, particularly in Germany, for example, uh, and we've done some in Austria as well, you know, uh, we, you know, some of the tours have included that. Now, some of the cruise lines, though, and river cruise lines will, will give you alternative excursions. So, um, you know, you might be one which is going to, a, 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 you know, to a farm, but another one might be walking a more historic walk. So it's not massively orientated, but you are right. A lot of people, the thing they love about river cruising is it's linked particularly to, uh, you know, famous uh, vineyard areas that they're passing through. But it didn't really get in the way, uh, you know, get in the way sounds terrible, but it didn't really, uh, you know, dampen there were plenty of other things to do. So even when we went, on on tours so i'm thinking of two actually one on across europe where actually the loire valley um you know some of those were going to to vineyards but they would also perhaps have uh, part of the tour would also be going and tasting local cheeses and some uh you know historic sites so it was pretty it was pretty it was, it was pretty it was pretty varied um i'll come back to only you've got a question which is about internet i will come back to that let me just answer um a, a, you know another um river cruise question here um so claude we definitely have a Christmas river cruise on our bucket list. However, however, we are concerned about the lack of space to simply walk around the ship. So, Claude, that is, uh, you know, that's that is an important point. You know, the ships are, of course, much smaller than you know anything you're ever going to see on on an on ocean, um, and they have to be because they have to be a certain width and a height to get under the bridges, even when water's high, uh, and you know, get, get along the river. So, Claude, if you are concerned about uh, size, there is. Uh, Emma Waterways has a Magna, which is a, basically a double-sized uh, ship. So it's basically equivalent to like two river cruise ships together, and they have more choices of dining options. Now, I, off my top of my head, I don't know whether they they run Christmas, but I suspect they probably will do. 
because it is sort of their flagship. Uh, also, they do have a little bit more, they try to attract more families, more multi-generational uh, travelers as well. So I'm pretty sure they will run that. But if you are concerned about it, you know, look at Magna from Amortes. But, you know, I wouldn't be too concerned. I mean, obviously, what would normally happen on a river cruise ship is you've got the whole top deck, the sun deck, which in winter, you're not really going to be using. So that has lost a lot of space. And you're only really going to have the sort of the lounge area is pretty much your only space you're going to have. Obviously, it's a dining room and you're, you're dining. But you will find, though, that on a European river cruise, there are there is relatively limited uh, time when you're sailing for, for a very long time. So you might only be sailing for two or three hours uh, when you're, you know, it, it, in a non-dining time or non when you're out. Um, so uh, I wouldn't be too concerned about that, but you're right. You're not going to have lots of places to hang out and chill and stuff, particularly on a Christmas cruise, because that top deck where you'd often sit out, you know, if you're sailing on a beautiful summer's day, you'd be out there and that would be plenty, plenty of space. But I wouldn't be too worried about it. And as I said, take a look at uh, at, at Magna. Um, so <clears throat> Heather, sorry, I, I have seen that some other questions not related to river cruising, but I'll just quickly pick up the river cruising ones as I see them. Hi there, Heather. So um, uh, Heather, our Christmas markets, uh, Christmas market river cruise, was a tongue twister. Our Christmas market river cruise in Europe often affected by high or low water. Do you have a favorite Christmas market? So Heather, that's a really interesting question. I have never, I haven't heard of Christmas market cruises being disrupted by low water. It's, that, which is interesting. I'm not sure why that would be, but I haven't heard that. But also, in reality, the core, I think the reason it's probably less of an issue is the core river markets are in the bigger towns, which is sort of the period. So even when I was on um, a Danube River cruise where we couldn't get past Vienna, um, you know, we still, that sort of bulk, that middle period, uh, middle period, middle section of the river, uh, is often not the one where it struggles. So to be honest, I haven't heard of it being affected. I, I might need to do a bit more research. Favorite Christmas market, I think I mentioned uh, you know, earlier, I thought the Vienna one was just amazing. Um, it was massive, it was sprawling. I, I really liked that one. That was probably my favorite one of the, the, you know, that, comes to, that comes to mind. I would say that's probably my, that is probably my favorite one. Um, so let me just answer some of the other questions so I don't lose them uh, in, in the flow. So Tony uh, was asking, I enjoyed my recent Norwegian cruise line through the Caribbean with the exception of the internet service. Do you know what cruise lines they'll start using? So pretty much, um, Tony, all of the major groups um, have said they're moving to Starlink. Norwegian, you're right, has been probably one of the slow, just in terms of rolling it across all the ships. So we had Starlink when I was on Viva, but they are progressively rolling them out. So even when I was on Regent Explorer, they had uh, Starlink uh, installed, but I know other people on other regions, they haven't. So they are rolling them out. So I think you'll see them coming uh, pretty soon. And I think Bill had mentioned, you know, on a lot of the Holland America ships, I think you're right, um, Bill. I think I, I've seen that they have now completed that installation. So they are uh, rolling out relatively, relatively uh, fast. Joan, I can't actually answer this question as much because I have always just kind of self-explored. So um, I, if anyone has a better suggestions, so certainly I, in, both in Curacao and Aruba, I kind of went out and did my own thing. So in terms of safety, I, I felt it was safe. I would always check, I double check, I always check the Foreign Office or the State Department what the current advice is, uh, if I'm going to self-explore uh, or, or check within the ship. The other thing, Joan, which is a really good resource, I know I've mentioned, I probably, I probably get a commission for the amount of times I mention it, is uh, the site whatsinport.com uh, all together. They always have a little section, if you put in those, uh, around the current situation on safety. You know, can you walk, can't you walk? I do remember in Curacao, uh, wandering out and strolling uh, around into the town and stuff, um, uh, so I think it's I think it's fine. But if anyone has more up to date information, because I haven't been to either of those since uh, since shutdown <clears throat> since shutdown days. Calling up what's in New York, very nice. Um, so Bruce, I see the question absolutely one hundred percent. Would you consider cru cruising the Mississippi on the American Steamboat Company? Well, when I say absolutely, for me, I absolutely really really want to do the Mississippi. It is high on my list uh, of things I want to do. Um, it is, again, like I was mentioning earlier, even in, like the European situation, it is quite expensive. Even, you know, American Steamboat Company is one of the more affordable ones, but it's kind of expensive, particularly to do solo. It's hard to get solo deals. So I was looking at doing one that, 
for 24, actually on Viking, because I was quite intrigued with the Viking ship. But I decided I'm going to wait till Mark can come and do that because it was just kind of a lot of money. So I absolutely want to do the Mississippi. It's really high on my list. Probably now not until 2025 because 2024 is now pretty um, pretty much. Oh, someone is uh, on Penang last trial coming back from Antarctica. Uh, that will be amazing. Um, let, yeah. <laughs> Le Chago, yeah, I know some friends of mine are about to go on that ship. Um, I It looks absolutely amazing. Hope you had a phenomenal time in Antarctica. Uh, I'm sure you absolutely, absolutely, absolutely did. Um, calling all ports um, from New York. <clears throat> what river cruise line has the best food in your opinion? We've only river cruise with Viking. Mother food was good overall, portions were small, and we often found ourselves hungry. Uh, I think probably the best food that I've had on river cruises, now I haven't been on every single river cruise company yet, um, but I thought the food was very strong on Amber Waterways, and I thought the food was very strong on Uniworld. Those were probably the two, and again, they, but they are also the kind of the, the, the more pricey end. But I think Amber Waterways particularly prides themselves on food. I also like the food that I had on Amber Water, uh, sorry, on Avalon. Uh, which is sort of more, I guess, a four-star kind of thing. Um, they had shifted their menus into kind of more healthy dining options, um, but I thought their food was, was was pretty good. I mean, I think you're right. My experience on biking, I thought it was, was good. It was one of those, I didn't remember it because of the food, uh, if you know what I mean. So, um, uh, you know, on the biking cruises I've been on. Um, interesting enough, even on, now, Crossy Europe was an interesting one because Crossy Europe is probably, the most the, the least expensive of all the river cruises that i've done and they have very french focused food uh and i thought that was pretty good but again you know if you need to like french food it's very very french so i would kind of put amber waterways um and uniworld as as the best um and again like most river cruise lines they do uh the buffet breakfast the buffet lunch and then the served the served the served meal i think the thing that i do find a little bit um, coming to your point about <clears throat> being hungry, <clears throat> excuse me, is that, um, you know, dining options are relatively limited. So most cruise lines will just have the main dining room. I know on uh, Viking they have, is it the Aquavit Terrace, um, which you can also book as well. But often you only have one dining option. So you don't have a, a you know, there might be a, some little snacks or whatever in the lounge um, as an alternative. But you, you, it's kind of not 24-hour dining or long dining because most of them don't have uh, room service. So if you're hungry, there's kind of very limited places to go. And that, that, is, uh, that is one thing that, that I found. And also the other thing is, is that the evenings on river cruises tend to be the full sit-down you know, courses of meals. So there's no quick dining option often on most river cruise lines. It's a full kind of sit-down um, thing. Now, hi, Ke, uh, hi there, good to see you. Besides the river cruise on the Mekong, are there any other river cruises in Asia? So, hi, Ke, the, the main and most famous one, as you said, is the Mekong, uh, which if anyone hasn't got it on their bucket list, if they're interested in river cruising, I would strongly recommend. It was one of the best trips I have ever done. I thought it was really absolutely magical and fascinating getting to, you know, south through Vietnam, south through Cambodia. Obviously, I'm very interested in history, learning about the event. Vietnam War and then learning all around the killing fields and stuff. And you get to see, you know, incredible places, um, uh, you know, as well, um, uh, you know, beautiful cities and the countryside and so on. But yes, so the other really um, popular uh, river cruising is there is some in India, um, I guess along the Ganges, and then there is also some in China as well. And I can't remember the name of the river now, but there are some others, but they're, they're, they're way less known. And I don't know whether the, I assume the Chinese ones are up and running again, but there is some in India and there is some in China. And India is another one that I have on my list, it's not high on my list, but I want to watch a documentary show about someone who went on that. And that was certainly very, uh, very appealing. Tom and Dom Traveler here, good to see you here. I thought of Tom and Dom, you were on Ambassador, no, you had visited Ambassador, you went on the Ambassador, the ambassador uh, trip. Um, now this is going to be this is one of those challenging questions because it's a bit like uh, uh, there's so many permutations. But uh, Christiane, that's how you pronounce your name. Uh, uh, hello from Porto, Portugal, beautiful, beautiful city. Um, which company would you recommend to cruise the Danube, and which time of the year? So, um, in terms of cruising the Danube, the, the, the advantage of the Danube is pretty much every. In fact, 
I think every line will, will cruise the Danube. So you have an enormous choice. So it is a little bit like ocean cruising where so much, so much of it then depends on obviously your budget because there's a wide range of prices. Secondly, what sort of experience you're looking, you, you're looking for. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Um, and then the sort of travelers that you want to be with as well, which is also very important. So, um, uh, you know, if you look at it from a budget perspective, roughly speaking, you've got sort of the five or six star uh, lines, which, uh, you know, you, as I mentioned earlier, you've got Uniworld in there. Uh, you've really got Amber Waterways in there. You've kind of got Scenic in there. Those are probably the three best known of the lines. Then you've got the sort of the four star. Now, some might argue the first or six star and the next the five star. But anyway, the next sort of grouping of those, you've got um, like uh, Avalon in there. You've got Viking in there. Um, are probably the best known. And then you've got lines like Emerald um, and uh, you'd also have, I don't think, with the, you'd, yeah, I think you, Emerald would probably be within, within the group because you've got Emerald's also owned by Scenic. Then you've got more value lines where you've got Riviera, you've got Crossy Europe. Um, I think a Rosa I would probably put in there. Uh, you've also got, sorry, I mentioned uh, one of the biggest, most popular lines is Tauk, which is really kind of up there with the Avalons, your Vikings, and so on. But they're all very kind of different experiences. Now, most of those that I've mentioned are very focused on, and you'll find mostly US travelers on. But if you want a more, say, UK experience, there are some lines like, for example, Saga, uh, you know, they run some river cruising. Riviera tends to be more, will be more UK passengers. Uh, for example, uh, Tui, as, as well, they they also have a very UK focus. If you want to have more German, for example, that's more Arosa. There is, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, across Europe would be more French, maybe a little bit more Spanish on there as well. So a lot of it then depends on, you know, uh, you know that that sort of thing. Now, what I, you know, that's who you want to be with. So I've been on across Europe, for example. I've been on some across Europe trips, like the one I mentioned earlier in the Loire Valley, where there was literally only two other English speakers. The rest of the, 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 the travelers on there, I think it was about 100 and something people, were French uh, and a few, a, a, a Spanish group. Uh, I've been on another one where there was like maybe 10. So, you know, it, it does kind of vary. So a lot of it depends on, 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 on what your experience want and your budget. Um, in terms of time of year, now, um, I personally like going at the beginning and the end of, of the season mostly because it's less busy because a lot of the places you're going to are also very popular tourist areas so particularly if you're doing the danube you're going to you know venice bratislava uh you know you know budapest those places get absolutely rammed july august time and can be incredibly hot so you know it, you know so i tend to like you know the beginning of the year beginning of the season, sort of, um, you know, June-ish time. I've been even earlier than that. I sort of like September. I always think it's a very nice time to be uh, traveling in Europe because it's still really warm. The days are still relatively long, but kind of the mad tourist stuff has has gone. So that, that would be my thoughts. You know, I remember we did go, was it October? Even in October, I did, my, it was the last annual cruise I did just before the year before shutdown. And, you know, even in places like Budapest was still really, really busy. Um, so, um, so let's have a look. James asked a question: What, uh, what are you, what are you yearning about the new European Esther and for the UK version? Uh, uh, yearning. I don't know whether you're asking if I'm learning or or whether I'm I'm looking forward to it. So I'll do the learning part first, and then I'll talk about the second part. So in terms of the European Esther, the, it's called the E S T I A. And for people who don't know what that is, is the, the European Union is introducing a new system which is similar to like an Esther if you're traveling into you know the US or Canada or like we're heading into Australia uh, uh, you know Friday uh, we have to get an equivalent uh, thing as well so they have pushed that back now to 2025 uh, and a lot, a lot of that was partly I think just getting the system ready you'll notice when you fly through airports there's lots of new machines and things uh, you know e-gates and things in place um, so uh, the, one of the reasons it was pushed back, it's been delayed a lot, but the French uh, didn't really want it introduced uh, because it's going to be introduced in the run up to the Paris Olympics next year, which of course they didn't want any disruptions. You can understand why. So it's been pushed back. Um, so the good news is it's been pushed back. Um, on the positive side, though, is one of the things that they look like, uh, and I noticed this a lot when I was traveling just the other month, is it does look like they, once they bring that system in, they're introducing 
e-gates where third countries can go. So at the moment, if you were heading into many European countries, flying in or whatever, you'd only EU and associate people like Norway, Switzerland, which are uh, you know, part of the, the common market and stuff, uh, they could use the e-gates. Um, but as a third country like the UK post-Brexit or the US, or Australia, had to you know, go through another system. Now, what I've noticed is the new machines are like when you head into the UK. So if you come into the UK, if you're from Canada, US, Australia, New Zealand, Korea, blah, blah, a list of countries, you can use the e-gates. And it looks like now what, it, what they're installing in, like in Lisbon, I saw it in, in, uh, uh, in Rome, I saw they now have gates for EU and they have gates for third countries. So the advantage with that system coming in is it looks like we'll be able to use e-gates, not have to queue up in, in the long lines. So I hope that James answered, I hope that answered your question. Um, Terry, um, I have Czech and and ancestry. Uh, do you recommend the side exclusions to Prague or a separate specific Czech Republic to be advised? So Terry, I would absolutely recommend the, the Prague side excursion. It is very popular and very common uh, for people to do that. I, most of the river cruise, I think, I feel like every river cruise I've been on, the Daniel River cruise, people have done the Prague. Prague is a beautiful city. I love Prague. Um, so, you know, I think, um, you know, I haven't explored a lot of the, of the Czech Republic, although they've changed their name now, haven't they? They don't call themselves a Czech Republic anymore. They, it, it, um, I've forgotten this bad. My geography should be better. They know they've changed their name. Uh, anyway, but the Czech Republic, uh, I haven't toured, I've literally only been to Prague and I've been to Prague a couple of times over the years. Originally, I used to go there um, for work when I was working full time. Then I've been there on a sort of a, a weekend break. And then I've been there as pre, uh, pre uh, uh, river cruise. So I would strongly recommend it because it is a beautiful city. It adds a lot to the tour and a lot to the trip um, uh, because it is one kind of those kind of iconic cities you, you want to see. Uh, and the river cruise lines have great itineraries, well linked to the beginning or the end of the river cruise. And they're very slick and well organized. So I would really, really recommend it. Um, so you know, that, that, that's what I would absolutely recommend. Ah, so let's say happy birthday, Michelle. Happy birthday. My, pre my present is a Caribbean cruise. Very, very nice. But I'm hoping we'll cruise in the future. Um, that's a wonderful present. Whoever gave that to you, very nice. I'll do a slide aside while I think about it. Um, one of the things that I was uh, I was approached, approached, I've sent an email, <laughs> by Cameo. You, you know Cameo where you do the, you record, where they get celebrities to record, I don't know I'm doing that, celebrities, where they get uh, celebrities to record greetings for people, um, birthdays or whatever. And um, Cameo approached me and said, would I set it up? So I set up a Cameo profile and didn't tell anybody because I thought, oh, do I want to go around to, um, you know, saying that I, I'm for sale kind of thing as it were. But it was interesting. People sort of found it that literally this afternoon I recorded one for somebody uh, who for Christmas is getting a Caribbean cruise. And I, they asked me to record a thing saying from person X to person Y, I'll try to be as obscure as I can, uh, you, you know, uh, you're, your partner's giving you this cruise and talk about the cruise and stuff. So that was quite fun. So if you're ever interested in that, I do have a cameo. It's cam cameo.com, Gary Bembridge. It's a little bit of sell there. Um, let's have a look. So from Facebook, Tom. So as I think I mentioned before, um, StreamYard, which I use to, to feed into YouTube, lets me also live stream at the same time on Facebook and live stream on LinkedIn, which is great. So the questions come up slightly differently because people type them in there. Anyway. Tom, good morning, Gary. Which Norwegian fjord cruises do you recommend for 2025? So, Tom, uh, one of the things you may have seen, um, you may have read, is that a couple of parts of the Norwegian fjords in 2025 are due to not be available to go cruising in uh, the UNESCO World Heritage fjords. And in my video around Norwegian fjords, I, I explain that a little bit more. But any itinerary you're looking at will have worked its way around that. So, I think, uh, Tom, the key thing with Norwegian fjords is a little bit depending on how long you want to spend there um, and what experience and how deep do you want to go. So for example, one of the things that I always encourage people to look at is if you have the time, because they do tend to be up to 12 days trips, is uh, Hurtigruten and now their competitor, which is Havalia, um, they run up and down the Norwegian coast, calling to loads of places. They, they, they take mail and they take uh, cars and people and stuff. But they have a very intensive stuff. So they also, will run itineraries for cruises because they you know, it's not a ferry uh, such it's a it's a cruise line as well as doing all this other stuff um, and they will 
then have a uh, very intensive, and you'll go right from Bergen all the way up to uh, Kirkenes, Kirkenes, uh, if that's how you pronounce it, uh, at the top. And some of them will go up and come down. So that will give you the most intensive part. It also means that you lose no days by sailing from uh, Amsterdam or Rotterdam or Southampton or Dover or whatever to, to get there. Um, so that is one thing I always encourage people to have a look at. So Havalia is the newest kid on the block. Um, they have very uh, eco ships. Um, they're relying much more on battery, uh, hybrid. Um, Hudegruten are moving that way as well, again, because of some of the restrictions selling in. If you want more of a combined, say you want a combined UK, I'm guessing you're not UK because you said good morning. So and it, evening is, I'm guessing that you're probably US or something. So if you're coming and you perhaps want to do some UK touring, you want to do some European touring, then, then there are lots of opportunities which will do seven nights or longer nights out of, um, you know, like, as I mentioned, like Southampton's the main port, but you can also do it out of other ports. So Fred Olsen will do some out of, uh, um, you know, Newcastle or Edinburgh or, or something like, like uh, something like that and head up there um, or you, out of Dover. So, uh, but there will tend to be seven nights mostly. So you, but you lose two days because you're a day getting there and then day getting back. Um, so what I always recommend if you are looking at that, also make sure that you've got lots of fjordy places in. So if you've got, you know, because Bergen's, Tabanga, particularly are quite big cities, but you want to get into anything that's sort of a, a fjorder at the name. So you want to make sure you get into those fjorder things. So that's that's the sort of second bucket. The third bucket is if you want to see the Northern Lights, there are then uh, cruises which will specifically, uh, you know, aim to get as far north as they can so you can see the Northern Lights. They tend to be a little bit longer. They tend to also be more sort of beginning of the season, end of the season, and some will even run in winter. So you'll have like Saga, for example, the UK line targeting over 50s, but others will run um, those cruises and many of them will have like a guaranteed see the Northern Lights. They all, as I said, tend to be when the days are shortest, a little bit colder. So those are kind of the three, the, the three buckets. The good news is, again, Tom, is many, many, many cruise lines will do it. So if you're sending out the UK, you know, uh, Pino will do it, uh, Cunard will do it, uh, Fred Olsen will do it, Saga will do it. Celebrity when they're based here will do it. I think even Princess will do it. So you'll find lots of options. If you're selling more out of, say, Amsterdam, Rotterdam, you'll find Holland America will do it. And so, so you have a lot of a lot of choices, uh, a lot of choices there. Um, oh dear, Karen, uh, tripped and fell, got no medical attention, flew home with two broken bones in my hand and a gash. That's that's. That, hope you are on the mend. That sounds really very very nasty. I'm surprised they didn't. Viking were normally quite good at kind of jumping in and and and. Uh, and sorting things out. So hopefully that you're well covered. Tom and Dom uh, asking a question on um, river cruising. So I did the Nile River Cruise this year, which was amazing. Would I do the Nile again? I'm not sure if I would. I feel like I've done it. Um, it's one of those things like I've done it I've, and I've seen it. And, you know, the river cruises all go to the same places because there are X things to do. Um, I did think it was incredible. Um, you know, so I, I would only do it again if um, I you know, like I really want to try a different ship. Uh, like I would like the Viking ship uh, really appeals to me, but I don't think I would do it again. I, it was very magical and very special, but it's not a place I would want to go back. But it's interesting you ask that because I would, I think, like to go back to the Mekong. Um, and I would like to go back to the Mekong at a very different time of the year because in the Mekong, they have kind of, you've got the, the rainy season and the, the, the dry season. And the Mekong dramatically reduces in size uh, from in terms of flooding, and I was there more than I was. I was there in, in fact, I was there in the run-up to COVID. I was there in, in uh, February, end of January, February time, when everyone was talking about there was something going on in China. What's this thing? Anyway, so um, the uh, but then in the rainy season, although it's raining a lot for the tour, uh, you know, for the tours is less good. But it, it the river floods, and it's when all the rice paddies and stuff go. So I think it's a very different experience. Also, you can then sail across the. Um, it's at the Tonsap Lake uh, when you're heading up to, you know, eventually go and look at Angkor Wat and stuff. So I would do the Mekong again because I think it's a very, very different, uh, very different uh, experience indeed. Uh, so so that's, that's that's what I would do. Thank you. Be cool to answer my question. Remember I was saying I couldn't remember the name of the Chinese one. So the Yangtze River Cruises, I haven't, I have looked at those. Um, they really, really appeal. Um, but the Yangtze River is the one that I looked at. I haven't looked at the uh, Chong Yang. Um, I haven't looked at those itineraries, so I, I didn't know about those itineraries. So thank you for adding those. 
But the Yangtze River is the one that I'm very interested in. The one that I've I have actually watched um, some some people some documentary stuff about it. So that's the one that I would most like to do. But I haven't. I need to look at those other ones as well. Um, so Rebecca, that's probably answered partly. Hopefully, that's also partly uh, answered your your. Sorry, that didn't come up. Hopefully, that's probably partly answered your 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 cruise. Uh, no, start again. The discussion we've had so far, hopefully, has probably answered this question. So I would absolutely, absolutely, number one priority would be the Mekong, and you do have quite a few options there. You know, I did uh, I did um, cross Europe, which have a very nice ship. Again, it was mostly French speakers on that. I think. Do we have three English speakers? No, there was three of us because it was a Japanese couple and myself, and they were doing everything in English because they didn't do Japanese. Now, good news with that is we then had our own guide for the whole trip for the three of us, whereas the French, you know, they were maybe groups of eight or ten or something, but literally we had one guide for three of us. It was fabulous, um, and the ship was very nice. It only held 64 people, and it wasn't even full, I guess, because that was when COVID was starting and people were starting to, to not travel. Um, but there is a very nice Amma waterway ship. There's some very nice Viking ships. There's some very nice Avalon ships. And Pandal, which sort of went bust during the pandemic but seems to have been resurrected, they have a more very old-fashioned uh, sort of T kind of two level -y ship. Um, looks kind of very oldie-worldie. Um, so those are, those are the ones that I sort of gravitate uh, towards. I did have a great time across Europe. Um, but again, it's, it's, a very, it's quite a French experience with the others are a more English, uh, American kind of experience. Uh, Warren Wolf, just making reference, in that video I did talk about earlier, I do talk a little bit about, uh, obviously one of the ways you can get free cruises is by being a, a journalist or a travel blogger or a vlogger, uh, but I don't do that. Um, I don't do that. I choose not to do that. So I can kind of be more independent and travel when I want to and stuff. Um, but that's thanks to you, because uh, I, it, without you watching my videos, uh, and YouTube being able to run advertising revenue, I wouldn't be able to do it. So um, as long as you keep um, as long as you keep watching, then I can keep doing that without having to go and do those. Uh, so that's interesting. Warren saying that Nat and Kara are putting out a comparison video of Christmas markets. Um, yes. So Nate, if you don't know Nate and Kara, if you haven't been watching the videos, it's a, they're they're a couple um, huge channel. I mean, their videos get millions and millions of views. Um, they're not to everyone's taste. Um, but because they're a little bit over the top, I find they're a little bit over the top. But you know, they do they do some really interesting itineraries. Like they do lots of train trips and stuff. Um, so that's interesting. I haven't seen their um, their their Christmas markets one. So that's a good one to know. Thanks for that tip off uh, there. Um, let's have a look. Let's have a look. Look. Here we go. So Gigi's answering the question on uh, Curacao. Right. So that was what I'd self explore any of the beaches. That's what I seem to remember. So thanks for for doing that. Um, Warren's saying that Nuremberg was his favorite. I, that's interesting. I, I think about it. I, when I went to Nuremberg, I wasn't, wasn't on the Chris, I wasn't on a Christmas cruise, but Nuremberg is quite an interesting city. Obviously it's got the history around it as, as well. Um, so uh, let's have a look. Um, <laughs> no name asking, well, who knows would anyone want to cruise the Great Lakes of America in the Mr. River. I do. I really want to, but it's funny. I did meet a couple um, on my last, uh, yeah, no, my cruise before when I was on Regent, who live on, you know, who live around the Great Lakes. Uh, I think Heather might live around the Great Lakes, if I remember correctly. And they were like, mm, "Why don't I do that?" Um, if I remember correctly. Um, but I, I would love to because it's, you know, it's. I've never been there, um, and I. I watched again a, another documentary show about it, and it really appealed to me. And the Mississippi, everyone says to me, it's it's really brown and and grubby, and so. But I'm very interested. You know, for me, uh, I'm very interested in the whole kind of history. You know, the Civil War, the slave trade, the plantations. Obviously, you've got attorneys. I've looked at. You've got obviously New Orleans, which I've never been to. You've got Memphis, which I've never been to. So that's what the appeal to me is. The, the mixture. You've got the music on either end. You've got the the you know the the, the Civil War and the slave trade and the that, so that's, I guess, what kind of attracts me. Great Lakes, I guess you've got some famous cities there as well. Also, the Great Lakes, some of the stuff I looked at, you can go from Toronto through there's some locks, um, as I understand it. Um, you know, you, you also get to see the uh, the waterfall, Niagara Falls, and then you go through. So that's that's kind of why I want to do it. So maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. 
Moonlight saying it's great with the history of America. So that's what. Um, Kate, hi there, Kate. Good to see Kate here. Have you sat on Princess lately or previously? Wonder what your opinion is considering them for an Alaska cruise. So the last time I sat on Princess was actually an Alaskan cruise. Uh, it was actually last Alaska season. Um, but I'd done three Princess cruises since the uh, end of uh, the pandemic. I did Sky Princess, I did Regal Princess, and I did Majestic Princess. I and I have made a couple of videos about my experience. I was, I was, I'm a little people say I'm a little bit down on Princess. I feel like Princess lost their way a little bit. They are a line that is evolving and evolving very fast. They are evolving to become much more family friendly. Um, you know, so their new ship, Sun Princess, which is going to be their biggest ship ever. So they're moving also into bigger ships. So like Sky Princess and stuff are 3,600. Sun Princess is going to be 4,000 something. So they're, they're moving to bigger ships. They're introducing more, you know, uh, more family fairs, attracting families. You know, Sun Princess is going to have lots of family friendly. It's going to be a rope course, kind of a water parky thing and stuff. So um, I felt they lost their way a little bit. Um, they, I thought the food was okay, wasn't great. I thought service was okay. <clears throat> it was one of those things I felt it was just okay. So I went on Majestic Princess. The thing I would say, Kate, if you're going to Alaska um, on any of those lines, it will be very busy. Um, it will be uh, selling over capacity. You'll have lots of families, lots of multi generational um, uh, parties on there. So I'm just going to have a slug them. <clears throat> I've got something stuck in my throat. <clears> throat> So I'm giving the negative, so I'll give the positive in a second. So, <clears throat> like, it, it wasn't a typical uh, princess experience. And it's a little bit like if you're in Holland America, it's not a typical experience because people uh, will go there because they want to go to Alaska. So they will choose a line that has the right itinerary at the right time. So it's not a typical princess travel. So it's a slightly different experience. So I didn't almost feel like I was on a princess ship. The ship was princess, but the experience wasn't. Uh, a lot of families, a lot of kids, so things like the pools, particularly the indoor Sorry, I keep bashing that. Indoor pool, uh, you know, was just taken over by the kids, um, um, for example, which is fine because you know that's what uh, that's what kids do and that's what families are there to do. But it's kind of a different experience. However, so that's the negatives. They are evolving. They are changing a lot. They brought in some uh, Rudy Solomon to help them re revamp their food. Um, they have though. Of course, introduce Princess Plus, different levels of Princess Plus. They're taking some things that were previously included, like Sabatini's Pizza. Uh, it's no longer complimentary. You have to buy Princess Plus before you can get it. So, you know, so they've taken a few bits out. Um, but on the plus side, you know, Princess is the second longest uh, line to sail in Alaska. So Holland America has been there the longest because they bought an existing provider. And Princess has been a very long time. So they know Alaska phenomenally well. They have also the land-based aspect, which is really nicely integrated. You know, their lodges and stuff are really nicely integrated, um, you know, with trains and buses and all sorts of things. So they are a good choice for, for Alaska. Um, you know, so they are a good choice. It's just I, I, the princess experience I felt a little bit lost, uh, lost their way a little bit. Um, uh, Laurel, hopefully I've answered that question. I think you're asking about the River Cruise View and, and can really hopefully I've answered that question. If I haven't, then um, then please, uh, please follow. So Cherry's saying you can't book out of Aquabiturus. I thought we did book, but maybe you're right. Maybe we just were really pushy and got in there quickly. Because um, uh, I remember we had dinner there once. Water. Amber Waters. If that's actually good, Warren Leo. Amber Waters is expanding in Colombia. I did see that as well. That they were. In fact, there was a Colombian-based um, uh, vlogger uh, who uh, actually messaged me about that because they were looking to cover it. Um, they were doing some work on Amber Waters and they wanted to use some of my Amber Waters footage that I had in Europe and so on for that. So, and that 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 reminds me. Um, let's have a let's have a look. Um, Elaine, hi there, Elaine. I'll be in Vietnam in January <clears throat> and I'm doing a Ha Long Bay cruise. There is an option to go into the caves and tunnels in the area. Have you done this? Would you recommend the caves? I haven't done that, um, so I can't comment. On, I, d I haven't done that excursion, so no, I, I don't. Uh, I don't know, but if anyone has, please, 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 I'll let Il Ilone know. At CT and AB, you might have heard the question earlier, but yes, I've done a river cruise in the Nile did this year. In fact, two videos on the channel about that, um, one of which is sort of more the experience, uh, and then the second one is kind of more, a little bit more tips related. Um, so Sherry, Sherry asking a question, have you heard of Viva? I have heard of them. I know nothing about them, but I have heard of them. Um, but I don't, I don't really know, uh, I don't really know um, very much about them. I don't think where I've heard of them from, whether I've seen their ships or whether I've read about them. 
Um, here we go. That's right. So the changes. I don't want to say Chesia because I don't want to get it wrong, but um, but that's right. It's the same as Turkey um, have changed the spelling of their 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 name because they didn't like being spelled the same way as Turkey's. Um, so uh, Sherry thinks it's cool. I do cameo. I was I was kind of really embarrassed about it. I don't know why I was embarrassed about it, but um, there. Bill's checked out. He's gone. Uh, so let's have a look. Um, Follow up on a combined UK fuels, although you're not a drinker, any recommendation from Scotland whiskey tour? So I have been, even though I'm not a drinker, I've been on a couple of whiskey tours. Um, uh, and um, I'm trying to remember the name of the thing. I can't think of them offhand. If I think of them, I will put, I'll leave them in the comments. Um, but there are quite a few of those. And if you're going on any kind of excursion, uh, you know, cruise excursion, they, many of them will, 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 will offer those. Um, I've actually been some, some really good ones actually in, in Ireland as well. Um, Dean asking a more general question. Um, since the start of hostilities in Ukraine and in Gaza, have you noticed any differences in your travel? Not in my travel because I haven't got anything that kind of heads that way. So the Ukraine doesn't really affect it very much at all because it's very far away from any cruising uh, kind of experience, although people got a little bit um, uh, concerned about that. And it's a bit of a, in terms of Gaza, it has affected quite a few people's travel because obviously, um, you know, all the cruises that we're going to call in Israel have, uh, uh, you know, been cancelled. Not surprisingly, so they've become Greek, uh, Greek cruises, Greek island cruises, and a lot of people um, have found that uh, stops if in places like uh, Alexandria or the port that, where you go to Luxor, many of those ports have been cancelled. In fact, I just was sitting on a Facebook group with someone who were very upset because their Silver Sea had dropped some of those ports. So it hasn't directly affected me uh, as such, uh, just because of the plans that I had. Um, the other difference it has made, though, has made one difference, is it's made my flight, like when I went to uh, to, to um, Japan, longer because they avoided Russian airspace. Um, and, uh, and I need to look at it with, because our flight to Singapore next week um, the, la the landing time got pushed back, made later. I don't know whether that's got anything to do with the flight path. That probably showing a horrible thing of my uh, geography, but um, but that's the only thing that I have seen. There is one other, though, Dean, important point, and I do make this in a video which is coming out um, next week, I think, or I'm doing a look at 2024, which no comes out the first week of January, with some things. One of the things that um, uh, has had an impact and is interesting is um, what I've seen um, is. Uh, uh, there is a reluctance of uh, particularly people coming from North America um, to, to come to commit to traveling to Europe uh, with a sense of, you know, the geography and the stuff going on and not sure where everything is and that sort of stuff, just general sense. So actually there is, um, whilst you're seeing in the Caribbean, for example, ships sailing well over capacity, there is much more capacity in Europe because people are reluctant uh, to come. And so I've seen some travel companies through, because I buy a lot of, uh, subscribe to a lot of travel media stuff to see what's going on, uh, travel agent um, and, and industry publications and sites to see what's going on. And they are strongly encouraging travel agents to sell Europe because they basically have a lot of capacity. So so it's, it's bear in mind, if we're looking for deals next year, Europe may be the, the, uh, the place to go. Ken goes cruising. Uh, what is your recommendation for a first river cruise with no fly? So, uh, if you're heading out of the UK, um, I have had some people which have caught the Eurostar. Uh, they and they all got messed up because they'd booked a river cruise, uh, which was heading out of Amsterdam. Now the Eurostar uh, has no longer goes into Amsterdam because they're expanding the, um, the they're reworking the railway line, uh, railway station in Amsterdam, and they need to reduce capacity. And the one that got hit was Eurostar. So they had originally booked um, a, I think it was a Saga river cruise, which was due to go to Amsterdam, or they booked through Saga, I can't remember the cruise line, because lots of river cruises go to Amsterdam, and they couldn't get the train there anymore. Um, but there are, uh, you know, so you could also get the train into Paris, uh, Eurostar into Paris, and get river cruises down the Seine. So I've done that before, got Eurostar to Paris and went down the Seine. Uh, uh, which is actually quite a nice river cruise. You could then head down and go down to the, the Normandy Beach landings on Hornfleur and places like that. Um, so those would be the key ones. But the, the, the Amsterdam connection is a little bit 
messy at the moment, but like that will reopen at, at some point, some point in time, I guess. Veronica, uh, good morning. Uh, asking a question about Antarctica. Um, it seems like I've, I've got lots of people qu questioning about Antarctica. I guess it's the time of year when people are then planning or thinking of going to Antarctica. Um, I would like to go to Antarctica next year. What month do you recommend? Any tips on itineraries? Thanks for your great channel live videos. So well, thanks very much. So Veronica, um, I will give you a quick answer that one of the things I would say is have a look at my videos as well. Um, uh, you know, if you go to the channel and then just a little search thing and search at Antarctica, because I've got quite a lot and I'll talk, to, I, I, there'll be things I forget to talk about here um, that will answer it. So personally, I like going at the beginning of the season, although I have also been at the end of the season. So the most popular time to go to Antarctica is December. Um, and that's also because uh, in terms of seeing wildlife, particularly, you know, if you really want to see a lot of whales, uh, you know, by then the penguin chicks are kind of out and about and stuff. So, you know, it's, it's um, you know, because they kind of left the nest and stuff. Um, I like going at the beginning of the season. I've been at the beginning of the season, the end of the season. The reason I like the beginning of the season, um, although there's some risk there, uh, is everything is incredibly pristine. Uh, everything you know there's a lot of ice there's a lot of snow so that also means a downside because if the ice it has not shifted enough you may struggle to get into some places uh, you know, so for example we were quite lucky when i went um the end of 21 uh, on Ponant because we were supposed to go through the the, the laminate channel which is a very beautiful channel but we couldn't get through because it's all iced up still when i went the time before in Silver Sea, we could get through there because I went at the end of the season. But what I liked about it, there was so, so much more snow, so much more ice, um, and it was really quite magical. Um, and it was interesting because I, if I, and if you do watch those videos, if you look at the videos for my Penant trip, which is the beginning of the season, versus the videos for my Silver Sea, which was at the end of the season, you'll see quite a big dramatic because we did go to one or two places that were the same. Like um, we went to, why have I forgotten the name of it? With the Caldera. Is it Elephant Island? Um, and there, the, when we went in the beginning of the season, it was covered in snow. We went at the end of the season, there was very little snow there, for example. Um, but I really like going at the beginning of the season. In terms of itinerary, if you possibly can, Veronica, um, it is going to take, it's got a longer trip and it's going to, as a definition, cost much more. But if you can go on a trip that includes the uh, Antarctica Peninsula, but also includes South Georgia, South Georgia is incredible. Um, it's, but you're talking then probably about, trips of 18 days or 20 days. So the first time I went to Antarctica, I just did the peninsula and I was blown away by that, absolutely loved it. And um, I decided I want to come back because I want to go to South Georgia. In South Georgia is where you will see, uh, you know, penguin colonies of 400,000 penguins. Then you'll go the next day and there's 250,000 penguins. Uh, you will go and on the beach, you will have elephant seals, um, you know, with males arguing over the females because it's kind of the mating season. Um, you'll see lots of chicks, uh, seals. It's just, uh, it's a absolutely phenomenal. Um, so if you possibly can do that, then you will call to other places. You might call it the Falklands um, and some of the other islands, you know, between the peninsula. So when I'm going back to Antarctica, because to me, it's just so magical. So I'm going back at the end of next year. And that's what I'm doing. I'm doing the South Georgia to go to Falklands, a few other places, and the peninsula. So if you possibly can do that, but if you can only do the peninsula, it is still magical. Um, there's not as many itineraries to, to South Georgia. And the South Georgia ones also seem to be more at the beginning and the end of the season, because during the season, they want to do the 10-day kind of get, you know, get people to the peninsula, um, and, you know, stuff where at the beginning of the season, end of the season, they seem to do more, more of those. Um, I don't know this trip. So what do you think of the region Caribbean and Amazon with round trip from Miami in 25? It sounds incredible. I would love to do that. Uh, uh, I've never been to the Amazon and I love getting down there. But if it's if it, sort of itineraries I've seen, it does sound absolutely, absolutely amazing. Devo's joined and, and late. Devo's always here. That point I hadn't really seen there. Um, okay. Rose asking the question, is the river a cruise port in Amsterdam located in the center of the city, close to walking attractions? So the river cruises... Uh, they dock just behind the railway station. 
so uh, they're right there in the center. So within the, you've got the railway station, then obviously you can get a you know, dominant bike or you can get the little trams. Uh, you've got the red light district and then you go further in. You, I mean, you can easily walk down. You've got the big square with the Royal Palace. But yes, it's very easy to get down. I've got the name of the road. But yeah, it is absolutely within all the walking attractions. It's great. It's a phenomenal location, which is why, you know, if you're coming in on a train from somewhere, it was absolutely linked to the previous question. You know, if you were getting the Eurostar uh, or you're catching the train from Brussels or whatever, you know, you come to the railway station, and you could get up the railway station across the road and the and the... The ships are, are, are there. Um, Steve O, uh, thanks. A little plug on the crew cruise. So, 283 days until the, the uh, New England Canada group cruise. So, let me give you a little, uh, little update on the group cruise. So, we have two group cruises next year. Uh, I have the one for members and patrons in April, which is a small group cruise, about 35 people. Um, so patrons and members go on that. So my first group cruise, I'm keeping that kind of small and tight. Then we have the Celebrity uh, New England Canada group cruise, uh, which uh, theoretically is closed. However, uh, if you are interested in that, uh, joining us on that, uh, there is a waiting list. Uh, and in the first week of January, we are pretty optimistic that we will be able to get more cabins from Celebrity to do that. So when uh, Sarah's back, from all her travels and Christmas and everything's done, uh, Celebrity are indicating we probably can get more cabins. So um, there's, there are people on the wait list for that, um, but she's pretty optimistic talking Celebrity. And I guess they're releasing more cabins because there's some other groups and things on. So if you are interested in that group cruise, if you, I'll try and put a link in this uh, in this as well. Um, but if not, just go to my website, tipsfortravelers.com, travelers of two hours. You see a little tab at the top which has group cruises and click down there and then you can go on there and find out how you can get onto the uh, into the um into the uh into, into onto the wait list but do that soon because in january hopefully we'll get more uh, yes i've heard uh, sarah talking about how hot it gets in memphis how unbearably hot it gets i've i've heard that in fact it almost looks like some of the root cruises almost don't do a bit of that a bit of that uh, a bit of that period um yeah, and so and, and then Kathy making the point about you're right, getting to, to the Rhine without you'd have to do a series of trains. You'd have to get a train and then train and train and train across uh, to to get to the the, the 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 starting points. So we have churned through time so fast, and I'm sure there are many trips. I always take a look at those. So let me leave you. Uh, let me give you my uh, tip of the my tip of the day, the tip of the week. Where's my tip of the week thing? Here we are. Tip of the top. No, that's topic of the week. Tip of the week, here we go. So what I'm trying to do is always end these with some sort of practical kind of little tip, but it's sort of like a hybrid gift slash giveaway kind of thing. So you might've seen behind me, I have these books here. I've got the Insight uh, Guides, Cruising and Cruise Ships, which is written by Douglas Ward. I think I might've mentioned it before. This is this is the, this has just come out uh, this year. It's the 39th year they've done it. It used to be called the Burlitz Guides. If you have someone who loves cruising, uh, this is a phenomenal book that you could give them for Christmas. There's another book here, which uh, Chris Frame, um, who is uh, a maritime historian, him and his wife have just published this book, The Evolution of Passenger Ship. It is phenomenal. I did have a giveaway on that one uh, for patrons. I always had one on this one. But um, if you, uh, it's an, an amazing book. It literally is like the Bible of cruising. Um, so that's a good Christmas tip, as it were. But also, uh, I do have a giveaway because I do have two, three of these books, um, the giveaway that's running uh, until the 10th of January. Um, I, in the notes of this, there is a link. Um, so you just go in there and you enter your name and email address. You, you, your email won't go into any mailing list or anything like that. Um, but enter that um, if, if you know, just go and enter that if, if you like. So that's my tip of the week. Uh, enter the enter the giveaway. It's just I had a great chance to publish. It. Send me some of those. I did a giveaway for the um, patrons. They send me some more um, to do as a more general uh, thing overall. So that is uh, one of the things I want to say is this is going to be almost certainly the last uh, live stream of the year because next week I head off to Australia and I think it's going to be very challenging looking at the schedules uh, where I'll be and where I won't be to do a live stream. But if I can do a live stream for the end of the year, I will try and do that. If not, I'm probably the next live stream will be the it will be next year. So if we don't have another live stream before, then have a wonderful Christmas. Have a wonderful New Year. Stay safe. Have incredible cruising. Thank you so much for all your support. And uh, watch my videos. Meantime, because videos will be coming out. But hopefully um, we will see you live 
uh, if not this year, early in the new year. So take care and have a wonderful, wonderful time.